All right, folks, welcome to another edition of the Raptors 2K podcast brought to you by Uber Eats. This is episode number nine. I know it doesn't seem like it, but yes, we've been flying through this series. Of course, I'm Phil Visu, joined by my main man, the best co-host on the planet, Shane. Talk to me, brother. How you doing today? I'm doing great, Phil. Uh, for those who've been paying attention since episode one, uh, we questioned how long it would take before Phil would follow me on Twitter. Uh <laughs> It took, you know, I, I will say there was a time when he followed me and I actually bragged to him that he was like my funniest follower because oh, Phil was letting it fly on Twitter back in the day. And it was hilarious. Yes. Still does some time, time to time. But like there was like a period there where I feel like you were probably my Twitter follower. Bro. So I was absolutely gutted uh, when it happened. And when Raptors Uprising came to me and said, hey, we need a co-host. We have a budget. I was like, there's one person on the planet I want to pay to be my friend. It's probably Phil Vizu. So let's get him in here and we'll keep track of how many episodes it takes before he follows me on Twitter. And the answer was nine, folks. But I now have my funniest follower back. So, Phil, I appreciate you for following me again, brother. You know what happened? I felt like the league turned their back on me, bro. When quarantine happened, I was like... Wait, I'm the league? I'm the man? I'm the establishment? I know. I, know. I looked at everybody as the man. And I was like, wait, they don't have, like, they don't need a host anymore because we're online. I was devastated. But wounds have healed, and we have gotten back to a good place. I'm personally very happy. You're, you're, you're on a greener style. pastures anyway. Greener pastures, man. You too. We're all just doing our thing out here for sure. Yeah, My voice yeah. is a little struggling. I'm coming off of a big Smash Bros <clears throat> event. I actually just did this past weekend. So forgive me if I sound uh, a little drained in that aspect, but I assure you, Pretty much engaged here. How was your weekend, man? What were you up to? Man, same same thing. I'm I'm a little hoarse because I'm coming off of like a week of bronchitis. So I'm not gonna Ooh. lie, it wasn't my best weekend ever. Missed a wedding, all that. Not here to complain, but yeah, I was kind of down and out with a bout of bronchitis. I just kept getting getting worse, man. And uh, you know, I feel like my energy's all back. I still got a little bit of a frog in my throat, so you'll hear it today. But maybe that'll actually like you know make my voice a little more sultry and listenable. This podcast versus like you know all energetic. <laughs> You know, high pitch so that's the goal right there well i know we have an amazing guest lined up for this episode obviously one of uh 2k league's premier players in my opinion the homie type will be joining us we can get type in oh, here boy. i mean we gotta talk man we got we got a lot to cover a lot to discuss the homie right there now type i brought oh. you in here to, i only brought you in here to observe first <laughs> don't speak yet i brought you in to observe but we gotta place our orders Uber Eats. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Have we jumped the gun. Life. We jumped the gun. That's all right. It's only episode nine. We're gonna work out the kinks, you know, by episode hundred or so. We'll get all the timing down, Pat. And and remind remind myself and the viewers, Phil, what, what exactly are we ordering through today? Well, I'm ordering through Uber Eats, obviously. Mm -hmm. Now, here's the cool thing. I'm actually back home in Baltimore right now, so I can order from this Jamaican spot called Tasha Max. It's amazing. Order like four beef patties and some oxtail. <laughs> I got to tell you, and I feel like I probably recycle the same for every, you know, if you went back and looked at the uh, episodes, there's probably only three or four different places I mentioned, but that's kind of how it works out, right? Once you find those best spots around you, I'm actually moving in like 10 days. So I'm looking forward to going to a new, it's kind of exciting when you like move. I don't know if, I, I don't know if people move as often as I do, but I have literally, since I graduated university in my twenties, you know, I'm, I'm 35 for anyone listening. Yeah, I know I'm, I'm a boomer, but uh, I have probably moved 11 times. Like there are very few places I've been for more than one year. So for me, it's always exciting when I move again and I get access to a whole new uh, set of restaurants on, on the on the delivery apps. Um, but I am also going with my favorite Caribbean place today, not Jamaican Caribbean specifically, but Caribbean jerk. Uh, it's one of my go-tos, just you know, little veggies, chicken and rice. You can't go wrong with it. And my man over there, he's really, really stingy with the uh, oxtail gravy. But I've kind of built rapport with him. He was really, like, you know, grumpy there the first go. time I went in there. He said, everybody asks for oxtail. They don't understand I got to sell oxtail. And I told him I completely understand. Now I know how to put it in the notes so that way he knows that I'm on his wavelength as far as, like, if he has it, I appreciate it. And if he doesn't have it, I understand. And he seems to always come through with it, so. I'm going to be placing a jerk chicken order from my man over at Sims Caribbean. That's the homie right there. Type, what do you, what do you, what do you do for lunch, man? What's your go-to? First of all, I just want to thank you guys for having me, man. Shout out to Uber Eats. And all year, Phil, I've been going with Wilbur's. And this is just something that I feel like the team all agrees on. I feel like the Wilbur's might be the best spot in Toronto right now. And I'm not just saying it just to say it. I really believe that it's, so what I get, it's called the Cali Burrito, and it's something my coach Kev put me on. Um, Kev Franklin, as you know him, <clears throat> he put me on this Cali Burrito, and it's crazy because it has, like, sweet potato in it, and it's something I thought I'd never try. 
and uh, it's like a steak burrito. Uh, you got all the good stuff in it, and then it has sweet potato, and it makes it just tops it right off. And I'm telling you, anytime I'm ordering from Uber Eats, I'm getting Wilbur's. Have you been to Wilbur on King, like the actual restaurant? You know what's crazy? I haven't. So Uber Eats has really been coming through this year. <laughs> so, so it's actually a it's a prime spot though, right on King Street, which is like the prime street you want to be on in Toronto. That's where all the like high end bars, clubs, restaurants are, as I'm sure you know, type. But Wilbur's mm-hmm. right there, kind of King and Portland, like prime location, right on King there, and it has the best fountain pop in the city, in my opinion. They have the best little kind of crushed cube dice, uh, or like crushed like little kind of like balls of ice, and uh, it's just amazing. So highly recommend if you're ever on King West, if you like Wilbur pop in and try it in the restaurant. But yeah, it's basically like a, a Mexican restaurant, Mexican food. Oh uh, yeah, Sounds best spot. Man. I mean, yeah, I live in Cali now, so I know about Mexican food. I'm all about that for sure. But I mean, obviously, you know, love talking about some good eats. They're on the way for sure. But talk to me about this season type, okay? Because I know it just ended. I know you guys are uh, still chilling in Toronto for like the rest of the month, just, you know, getting the vibes down and uh, doing some content and stuff like that. But talk to me about the season, man. Where do you feel like, uh, where did it go wrong, my guy? Where did it go wrong? <laughs> With the hot questions. Hey, you know what's crazy, Phil? Because me and you haven't talked since season two. And season two, oh, I wow. was on the throne, it feels like. And, uh, <laughs> you know, now I'm talking to you and I'm kind of at the bottom of where you can be right now. But, um, you know, where you go wrong, I, I honestly, Phil, um, that's a great question. Uh, I think the team came in with great mindset. We came in thinking we had a great team. Um, you know, honestly, I believe we had a great team. I just think um, a lot of us in general, we had stuff that we had to work on uh, that we came into the season with. And, you know, some of these problems that we had with each other, uh, I think they could have been solved if if we honestly just looked ourselves in the mirror. And and I think as a team and as a player individually, you find out who you are throughout the season. And uh, I definitely in season four, figured out a lot about myself. I mean, I went from going from Charlotte, uh, being almost a candidate for all-star center to coming to Toronto and losing almost every game after they went 16 and 0. So a lot of it, I looked at myself as, you know, what am I doing wrong and how did this happen and, and how can I better myself? And I think this, this season five, I came in with a great mindset and obviously we had a uh, Kenny and dimes, two great guys with me. And <clears throat> in the draft, I think we kind of understood what we had to do. Um, Dimes knew that Kenny wanted to play guard and the ultimate decision came down to whether, what did Dimes want to play? And I think for myself, I kind of thought that, you know, Dimes could become a great center if we have the opportunity to get a guard. And there was a lot of guards in this draft, but there was a few that we had in mind that were in the top 10. And I think Phantom was one of them. And at the time he was literally killing it on retail. I mean, he was getting a thousand streamers. He was doing what he had to do to get into the league. In the year past, he didn't get into the league. And I think that kind of hurt him. I think that put a chip on his shoulder. And and that's one reason why we keyed on that kid. And he was great. Like, to start off, he came in. He was hot. Uh, we were winning scrims. And Saint came in. And, and one thing about Saint is uh, he's a guy, he's a game changer on defense. And he's somebody that's going to come in. And he's passionate like myself. And I look at Saint and I ask him a lot of stuff on defense. And, you know, um, for me, Dimes, Kenny, we knew that we had a great two. And I don't think we really understood that <clears throat> what we were doing off the court was affecting our on the court decision. So like, for instance, to break it down, Phil, we just weren't a team that got along off the court. And honestly, if, if you're going to be a great team in this league, you got to like each other and you got to feel like the guy right next to me is somebody I really trust. And the guy right next to me is somebody that I can go to war with. And I feel like you asked the question, where did the season go wrong? And if you come into the season feeling like you don't already like a guy, right? I think that's where the season can go wrong. And I think that's where problems can happen already that don't even really necessarily need to happen. I think it's <clears throat> something, one of those things where you kind of, you just kind of got to talk to the guy and, and figure out what's going on. Cause for a few of us, we loved each other and and not for the whole team, but there were guys that were kind of separated. And I felt like uh, throughout the season, you know, we kind of bonded more and more better, but it, it just, it just wasn't there to start off. And, and it was hard. I think it was hard on all of us and it was hard on dimes too. Uh, and, and that's probably what ultimately led to the trade. Well said, my man. And Hey, listen, having been there in season four, having done the trade to bring you in um, and, you know, you know, experience that, 
fall from grace myself as well, right? And you know, the one responsible, uh, honestly, for it. Uh, you know, analyzing how you know why we made the call we made, etc. I mean, all made sense, all sound decisions at the time. And you know, that's the thing about sports, right? Like hindsight, it, it's like sports is that thing where like once once you have the hindsight, it's like everything seems so obvious. Very few like fans, like armchair analysts, can actually remember what the circumstances were at the time that the decision was made, right? Like they always, that's why you get such opinionated people in sports on, on social media for sure. But, um, you know, I, I can say that we had Sam Pham on last week. And, you know, I don't know if you've caught that yet, but we asked him who his favorite player he's ever coached was. And he said, you. Uh, and, you know, that was awesome to hear because, you know, like you said, you know, not only were you, you know, the top defensive center in the league when you were on the Hornets, and, and that's kind of why we traded for you. Um, but you also dealt with a suspension, right, and had chemistry issues, and you were part of the problem, not the solution, you know, on the team. And, you know, again, I, I don't know anything, and I don't want to, you know, make any assumptions necessarily, but you were a top player. It seemed like part of the nucleus in uh, in in uh, on the Warriors, and, you know, they let you go, right? So I, I don't think they let this version of type go. You know what I mean? You've grown by leaps and bounds as a person. And that was what I could, you know, you, I mean, you know better than anyone. Like we had 90 minute conversations where the first 40 minutes we were swearing at each other. You know, it was like screaming at like, you know, like we were not on the same page, but anytime I made a point that I could see, you know, like made an impression on you or that like, you were like, Oh, I never thought about it that way. You were like open. It was a different type of like stubbornness than I've seen with some other players who were creating problems in the team. Right. Which is like, they just didn't want to hear it. You wanted to hear it. You were looking for guidance. You were looking for advice. And that's what I kept telling Sue McKenney, some of the people. I'm like, listen, I really think we have a guy here that we can help kind of develop, coach, you know, turn into more of a professional. Uh, and if we can do that, we can unlock the talent that we know he has on the sticks. Like, we've got a, a great player. And, you know, there were definitely times where you know type. I mean, you requested a trade, right? Like, you were one foot out the door. We were, like, you know, probably on the one-yard line from giving you a shove out the door. Just kind of, you know, whatever, licking our wounds and bringing in whoever we could bring in at that point in time. And instead, you know, you're now one of, you know, management organization's favorite players because you're such a professional and you know you're such a part of the solution and no longer part of the problem so kudos to you for going through that you know personal growth and development and you know everything you're doing in your life as well i know you've got a charity that you're uh, that you're building and you know i think the rappers are helping you with that and so we should talk about that later on in the podcast but just man uh, you know credit because i have bet on people in the past where it hasn't worked out and you know, you're an example of one where i thought i saw something and it really did work out so respect appreciate that shane that means a lot damn okay I, you know what to be honest man not everybody gets that that gets that pleasure, man. Gets that 180 redemption, man. So so much respect to you. Um, I mean, when I was watching you play, when I knew you, you know, you were obviously, as we said, like a beast center. But I think you're playing like a, a lot of power forward this year as well. You have a preference on a, a position there, or like is that maybe like something you wish you. Could I'm gonna have give been... you, I'm gonna give you something, Phil, that I, I I've been telling, <laughs> and this and this is this is something I really haven't really said, Phil. And honestly, I'm gonna just say it on the podcast. I, I feel like I made a That's huge why. mistake playing power forward this year. I feel like personally, I came into the league uh, thinking, <clears throat> you know, a lot of guys, they're, they can play two different positions, but they can't play them at a high level, right? Mm -hmm. And early on in the season, I felt as if I, oh, it was a lot of things at power forward that I didn't really know I had to learn. And I knew I wasn't playing my best at power forward, Phil. And so throughout the season, I wanted to see myself progress. I wanted to see myself get better. And I can honestly say that I wasn't really playing to the the level that I felt like I could play at. And that hurts, right? And as a competitive player in this league, you can't have bad seasons. You can't have seasons where – you definitely can't have back-to-back -back bad seasons, but you can't have seasons where you fall off and people forget about you. And I felt like it was one of those seasons where they're looking at type like, wow, you know, you went from center to power forward. It's one of those uh, – he can be forgotten moments. And, and that kind of like, you know – I had to look myself in the mirror again in another season, like back-to-back -back seasons. I'm like, yo, maybe this is a decision that I just shouldn't have made. And um, I really believe center is a position that that I'm going to be playing, you know, forever in my career. I don't think I'll ever get off that position. And I think going forward, um, if there's ever an opportunity to go back to power forward, I feel like I could do it, but only to the level where I want to be playing um where i was at center you know season two i want to be playing at a high level i'm going to another position i don't want to be hurting the team and i felt like this year i was hurting the team at power forward it wasn't something that was tremendously hurting us but it was something that just didn't give us enough you know i wasn't getting i wasn't creating a lot of turnovers um there was times where i was missing shots and i think um there's other power forwards in this league 
uh, that can attest for this, it, you know, it's tough playing that position. It's a really tough position. And it's one of those positions on the court that, you know, it might be the most important at times. And you're going to have to get stops. You're going to play at a high level. And I just wasn't there. And I think, um, you know, I don't regret anything. I don't go back and, and say, oh, I could have did this better. I could have did that better. But I definitely feel like I made a mistake going to that position. But I still don't have any regrets. Um, I just I just feel like center at heart is where I need to be. And, you know, Phil, I think going next year, I'm going to work a lot in the offseason, get my center game right. Um, I still still ain't there where I need to be. And um, I got a lot to yeah. work to do. So to get back to that position and going hard again is what I need to do. Hey, I, I respect the accountability there, but let's call a spade a spade and remind everybody or those who, who weren't following along, just let everyone know what was actually going on behind the scenes. It wasn't even that you decided to go to power four where you just accepted, you know, the strategy that the organization was asking you to accept. It wasn't like you came to us and said, hey, I really think I can be a difference maker at power forward. As you put it, you know, we had Dimes and Kenny, um, you know, and I can tell the history on this. Like we, we made what was definitely a smart trade for Dimes when, when Reese Mode which wasn't having a good second season. And we were completely down and out and it reinvigorated our team in season four. Um, you know, we got a bunch of big wins against playoff teams. We were heading into the, the ticket hot, didn't work out in the ticket, but like Dimes revitalized, uh, revitalized our season, gave us, you know, a breath, you know, a breath of fresh air, you know, glimmer of hope. And, you know, the option was, you know, let Dimes go back to the draft pool or keep them. And the analysis was pretty simple. If we let Dimes go back to the draft pool, we're getting a fourth rounder. And we just were looking at the depth of the positions we would need to draft at. And we were like, we just don't see ourselves getting someone who can add more to this team than Dimes can in the fourth round. So let's stack talent. You know, there's some relationships there. Again, things were good with Dimes for the most part, To you know, when he came in in season four, right? Um, now it was a short stint and again, it started off with some success. So it was easier to say, but easier to accomplish, I guess. But anyway, point being, we were just looking at what we had. And at that exact moment, Dimes started playing center in retail and like getting to semifinals of tournaments and stuff like that. And we were like, Hey, we have this top pick, this early pick in the first round. You know, there's this, you know, potential to go and get like, you know, our future guard, like some sort of a glitchy stage guard, someone who could play threes for us, you know, um, with this pick, but we also have Dimes and Kenny. So what do we do? Right. And it just made sense if we were going to prioritize a guard, like, a, a, you know, a one, Kenny was really like already a natural two anyway. So let's let Kenny go to two dimes. We felt like had that, like, you know, that IQ, that floor general, you know, nature in him that like he can kind of play the macro chessboard and be like maybe a little bit more of a dynamic center, you know, could shoot, you know, et cetera. Um, and we asked you to go to power forward and you just accepted it. Right. It was, and you know, what was, again, like thinking back to like, you know, in the end, it turned out not to be the right call. Hindsight's twenty twenty, But at that time, we had to really work on convincing Dimes to go to center. So the fact that you were like, yeah, I'll do whatever the team asks was just like, okay, great. Checked one box. Let's move on to like the bigger fire right now, which we need to focus our attention on. So anyway, just want to bail you out a little bit. It wasn't your decision. It's not like you screwed up by, by planning to go to power forward. You did what we asked you to do. It's called speed to speed. Well, to, to piggyback off of that, is that is that anything? Is that one of the reasons that might have caused some like friction or animosity within the team, like the chemistry? <clears throat> Honestly, I don't think it did between me, Dimes, and Kenny. Just because we're, we were the type of people who kind of understood each other. And I think the good thing about Dimes is when he trusts you, he trusts you, right? And he liked me and Kenny a lot. He really he really did. And I still text uh, Dimes to this day, and, and so does Kenny. And I think he kind of understood like where we were coming from. And Shane, I really like what you said. But... I feel like at the time I should have protected my center spot. I should have said, sure. hey, y'all, listen, um, uh, I feel like I, I have to come back harder and I need to play this position. And and I feel like that's just something that I got I to gotta do next year. I got to be willing to demand that what I'm doing is going to be right for the team. You know, it, it's not going to be a 50-50 call. And I feel like me going to power forward, it wasn't really – the best decision but it was something that was like it could work it can't you know and i and i don't really think at the time i was thinking that but you know after the season looking back on it it's just you know it's something i felt like i could have said the dimes like hey i'm playing center uh whatever we do we're just gonna have to lock it in you know and and that's all right you know the decision going to power forward like i said i feel i don't have any regrets you know i feel like dimes was a great center when he was here and obviously he's been great with the buck so you know it works it just works with different teams and Shout out to Dines for going that far. But, yeah, he really liked me and Kenny. I don't think it created anything between us, but um, I'll definitely but I say think, But that. I think when we struggled in the backcourt a little bit, Dines was probably like, hey, 
you know, maybe 100%. I should go back to the back. Hundred percent. And hundred percent. I think that's just natural for all players, though, right? If you play a certain position, and you see somebody like Kenny that that's MVP level, and you see a guy like Fana that got drafted seventh, and you're seeing them not play their their best, I think it's kind of natural for you to say, "Hey, let me try the position." I think that's that goes yeah. for everybody, and that's not something I feel like should have created any problems, but it could. You know, who knows? I didn't really talk to him much about it, but um, you know, he he's doing well now, so that's all that matters. Yeah, for sure. I mean, we he and I haven't uh, really exchanged messages, but it was always like a good cordial relationship going back to like season one, just DMs here and there and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, I know how much he wants his 2K League career. You know, I know how much it means to him and matters to him. And um, even though we, you know, always had to put the interest of the organization first, like part of me was like, oh man, I, I hope, you know, what we're doing here, I hope, you know, him getting traded, I hope that's not the end of it for him. And luckily for him, and, you know, I'm, I'm glad he went to, you know, Milwaukee and it worked out and he's had a great season. I'm sure his career has been revitalized by it. So, uh, you know, it's like that old, uh, that old, uh, you know, sort of philosopher, uh, who's just, you know, it's like that, person's having all these you know good things happen to them oh you know that's so amazing we'll see and then these bad things happen oh that sucks and we'll see and then these great things happen mm -hmm. oh we'll see. you know and everything just kind of spirals right you really never know which are your blessings uh, until you really see things play out so uh, yeah. always important to you know and that's part, part of why i tell people not to get too high or too low you know what i mean just kind of stay even keel right. especially in a in a career like this tight um season's over so i feel like you should be a little more freer to speak now let's talk about like your Let's talk about the other teams and players this year around the league. Who, I guess to start off with like a softball, a bit of like a, you know, an easy one, say some nice things about some guys. Who are like your top three players in the league this season? Mm, I like that question, Shane. Um, you know, honestly, uh, for one reason and one reason only, I think when you, when you have the consistency you have, like the Wizards, you got to have a top player on that team. And, I just want to give a shout out to Day Fry because to bring this team in the three v three playoffs and five v five playoffs with a trade midseason, and to have a guy that isn't JBM, and to have all the talk saying, "Oh, you don't have JBM now," I just feel like Day Fry is top three, and I don't know where he ranks, um, but he's definitely top three. And uh, another guy I want to name is Shifty Kai. I feel like this kid might be the best two K player there is right now, off the simple fact that. He's just a scorer. He's a bucket getter, and he plays some of the best defense you're ever going to get from a guard. And Shifty Kai is definitely up there in my top three. Uh, so if I got Day Fry, Shifty Kai, um, I need a third. Um, you know, honestly, and I may sound biased here, but uh, CB13 might be my third best player in this league just because of the consistency the Warriors just have as well going to the playoffs and making it with about as anybody, you know, right? And I think he works well with all players, but – the one player when they just brought is Nadal, Mamad I'm that man. I think he's showed that he can really work with almost anybody in this league. And Nadal's a guy that really demands the ball, right? And Keen is a guy that, that likes to do scoring himself. So I think seeing him being able to coexist with a guy like Nadal is just really special. So uh, I think my third player definitely had to be a guy like CB13. Obviously, I played with him in season two. I won a lot of money with him. I think he's definitely one of the top players in this league since he came in the league as a rookie. So uh, he'll be my third. That's good and respectable. I definitely agree with Day Fry. That that dude is is built different. And then Kai, I remember like the first. I don't remember if he came in in season three, but I remember watching like the first season he played. I was like, he was pretty good. So I, that's you know that doesn't surprise me. And his CV's always been a G. Like, that's nothing new. Um, <laughs> for me though, I want to know who your three most overrated players are, bro. Who them people <laughs> who got the egos? Oh just man, yeah, like this, this, this one's getting clipped for Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> I just got listen. Is, I just want to. I don't like this one, man. I don't like it, man. All right, you don't like it. Phil, you asked three most overrated players in our league. That doesn't mean they stink. Wow. That just means they're overrated. They're, mean overrated. they're, they're good. Could be good players, but they get like elite player reputation. Exactly, bro. Yeah, I don't like this. Can you imagine if I said one of my own players? Nah, that'd be crazy. <laughs> that'd be uh, wild. Let's see. Damn. I gotta figure this one out, man. Because there's a lot I of guys that I really, on your head. I really love a lot of guys in this league, and for me to just say their name, I would just feel so wrong. Um, 
Okay, what players? Well, you can explain it though. You can provide the context. I'm, so you know what's like... crazy is I wish I had an answer. I'm really trying to think of this. I don't have anything that's popping in my head right now. Okay, it's not like I more, don't more say similar it. vein, similar vein, but more analytical focus. Who's who fell off the hardest from last year? I like that. Mm. I like that a lot because it's more about like individual performance versus like you know, just a bad season. It could be just a bad season. Yeah, living right? off rep. I just say... like look like a look like the league you know, elite last year and this year just hasn't been able to follow it up. I mean, I haven't been watching all the other teams much, but like 630 was like on the map last year. Is he still having a good I guess, season? you know, I'm not going to lie, Shane, that might be a really good one because to go from MVP, Rookie of the Year, to getting traded midseason and now that your team didn't really win anything in fives, you guys are looking at threes like your only hope. So I guess mm -hmm. that pace, you know, oh, well, they traded for that, but that Sixers team is not – it's not as good as they once were with Reezy, I think. In my opinion, 630 kind of made their team a little bit different. But Dre and 630, if they figure out a way to um, find a way to play with each other well, I think it could work. But a as of right now, you could say he's the most overrated in the league just because you went from MVP to almost nobody even talking about you anymore. I, I honestly don't think he really is get gets mentioned as much. Um, but, yeah, you could say 630. Um, you know, honestly, it's a lot of guys in this league and I, I even include myself, you know, I feel like I went from the top to the back to the bottom. I kind of fell off. You could say that, um, you had guys like, um, BP kind of came in the league, kind of really hyped up as a three V three guard, really overrated. I feel like in that, in that aspect and then Gallo as well, I think Gallo, and even Fanner, like we had great three V. There were so many three V three guards that had high expectations and just didn't really live up to the three V three hype. And I think a lot of it had to do with some of these guys played stage, and it was a lot of ISO ball. So when you seen Gallo, and Fanna and guys like um, BP in these three V three tournaments, they weren't doing well because a lot of the teams that they played had a lot of movement and they were going for slips or pops. And you look at Fanna and and you look at BP and you look at all the ISO guards, you know, it was tough for them because ISO one really wasn't the meta in the 3v3 side this year. And I think a lot of 2K players kind of changed the meta because, you know, we're some of the best players in the world. Our minds are always working. I feel like certain players came up with different ways to manipulate the ISOing and mm -hmm. manipulate the the short guard. So if you were an ISO guard, you used like a six foot. And a lot of that you could really like go after on the defensive side. You could put them in a pick and roll, put them in a pick and pop, and it was tough for the six foot to guard all that. And I think that was big, and that was something that we didn't really expect going into the 3v3. So a lot of the good 3v3 guards were really came in, and they kind of just didn't do anything. So I'd say most of the most of the 3v3 guards kind of came in pretty overrated. That's an interesting insight. I haven't heard anyone else say that. So because I've heard a lot about how 3v3 didn't play like retail, didn't play like everyone kind of expected. Obviously, the 2K League has never played like retail in five on five. Um, but I think that the 3v3 was a push to try to become more relatable to the bigger, you know, retail audience. And it didn't play that way. So so you're saying that has more to do with the caliber of players than it does with the parameters that were sort of put in. So are you saying then that there's really it's, it's never going to be possible for the league to have something that kind of plays like stage retail? in 3v3 mm, it's tough because like if you're an, if you're a guy that likes to iso if you're a point guard that likes to iso it's obviously going to work in retail uh, i think there's a lot of different things that factor into that just because you have more stamina you have a higher three-pointer you have all these different badges some badges that you don't have in the league version of the game um and you know kind of what the league has went towards is a more competitive skill gap. They want something that's kind of like fair for everybody, but they also want it to be a little bit harder than retail. And I think you've seen that ISO one was just tough. And I don't know if it'll be a thing next year either. It's just because the amount of good players in this league, they're always going to figure out a way to game plan against you. They're always going to come up with ways to beat you. And the guys that were, like I said, Shane, guys that were using the six foot guard we're really getting put in the pick and roll, pick and pop situations. And I think when the Wizards won the first 3v3 tournament, the very first one, nobody kind of knew what to use, right? And the Wizards won with two shooting guards and a power forward. And so they went with Dave Fry on a shooting guard and they went with Deanie on the shooting guard and they put Awkward on the power forward. So that was just something that everybody kind of looked at like, okay, they kind of changed it up. They went with two six fours and a six eight. And the kind of meta was like, 
you're going to use a lock, a six foot guard, and a six eight. And they didn't have a lock, they didn't have a six foot guard, but they had the six eight. So they had two different archetypes that were completely not meta, but they kind of made it a thing. And I think that just shows how good the Wizards are and how much mm. they're always thinking and game planning. And, you know, kudos to them because you couldn't tell me before we came into this season that the Wizards were going to win a 3v3 tournament and they're going to do it in a completely unfashioned way, like with double guards and a power forward. We were, and I just thought it we was were crazy. scheming. We were scheming for their picks because we just assumed they would have great picks next year because how could they possibly compete when they had a late first round, like the you know, end of the first round pick and they lost JBM, right? Like we totally wrote them off and yeah, it just goes to show that, you know, for, first of all, JBM is a fantastic guard worthy of all the credit, you know, credit, you know, credit that he gets, but also he had an amazing core around him and, you know, yep. to this oh, day, yeah. they're still there. On that note, who, which core, you know, which team struggled this year, but has a core that you think is like, you know, one good draft away from just like really piecing it together. Who's that like high potential mm, squad? I think that could be the heat, honestly. Um, the Heat were actually a team that we had played early on in the year, and I thought they were terrible. I thought this team was bad, and they honestly have just surprised me and surprised me, and they actually made the 5v5 playoff. So, you know, they're not that far off from being a great team. And I think they are still a good team. I just don't know if they're a great team. And when I say that, I think they have a whole bunch of good guys. Um, I've met Dietrich in person. Now I didn't get to meet him. He's such a good, nice guy. And then Saucy, I think. Saucy's been a great testament of what it means to be a true professional and all the things he's done in this league. So I uh, definitely lo love what Famous has did to build his team. And then B Smooth, a guy that I've played with before, he's such a great guy in this league. I mean, he's been highly skilled every time he's been, every season. He He's had like a down season, I'd say, his last season, season four. But he's came in with a chip on his shoulder, and now he's in the playoffs probably five. But, you know, there's rumors that Sav might even <clears throat> not even play in the 2K league next year. So... I think Ooh, you heard for, it here first, for a folks. Team, so for deep. a team what? like uh, the, the Heat, for a team like the Heat, they could be they could be like a player away from being really tough. Dietrich is a guy that really was uh, special in retail. He was one of the top power forwards, and I think that's why Famous took the risk at drafting him early, and it kind of paid off for him. Dietrich has been great this year in the league, and uh, Saucy going to center and um, showing that he can play with some of the best of them. I think that team is really. Honestly, a, a player away. Not not to say where that player is going to fit in. Uh, I don't know what position, but I feel like they kind of got be smooth. They shooting guard. They kind of got a D-trick. They power forward. And then, like, kind of mix around. Their future clutch has been really good at lock. He's kind of like a, a a really good, like, vibes guy. I say future clutch, future clutch if you don't know him, um, he just really – he's just a funny guy. He's just, like, a really goofy, funny guy. And uh, he's fun to be around. So – I think that team has something going for them. They kind of got a good chemistry. They all love each other. And when you have that, you can truly win something great in this league. So uh, I'd say they're like a pick away. But shout out to Famous because they went from almost being nothing to to something again. So I know he's well, happy. Yeah, man. I mean, if they're just a pick away, you know what I'm saying, then some of our Canadian listeners are only a DM away because we have a little promo from Uber Eats. You know, for those listening right now, you can send a Twitter DM to at Raptors GC with the phrase Uber Eats type family foundation. The first three people to do that will receive a $25 Uber Eats gift card and get yourself a meal while you enjoy the podcast. So make sure you check that out. The show. That's a good segue type. I want to I want to wrap on some predictions uh, for the end of the season here for everybody who's listening. When you're I'm not sure when you're all listening, but the ticket and the steel just wrapped up. Uh, so those are the wild card tournaments for anyone less knowledgeable. Uh, we were in both tournaments, so that means we were out of the playoffs uh, for both three v three and five v five. Competed in the steel, which is the three v three wild card tournament. The ticket, which is the five v five wild card tournament. Basically, one team out of the east, one team out of the west, won their way into the playoffs through that tournament last week. We unfortunately did not, and so our season season is over but now we're heading into two sets of playoffs which is kind of exciting the first time the 2k league has had a second playoffs for 3v3 so i want to get you to do predictions on that but before we do that uh phil just mentioned the type family foundation that is the code to win the uber eats gift card so why don't you uh tell the listeners a little bit about what you got working on what you're working on over there i appreciate it you guys uh you know it's something i really haven't really talked about to anybody yet i mean still in the work still in the beginning um but yeah so me and my friend uh his name's jason We've been friends since middle school. Uh, we've done a lot of things with each other. Uh, one of my best friends, I can really call him, you know, truly a day one. You know, since day one, I met him at middle school. 
been a great guy, stand up guy. And we kind of came together uh, after we graduated from Apple High School. We went to high school together, um, and we kind of knew once I got into the 2K League that this was something special. This is a, a platform that I was gonna have that you know kind of nobody in the city of Indianapolis had. And you know, me and Scuddy both got drafted and. And I never really thought about what I could do in this league until I was like maybe three seasons in. Like season three, I'm like, wow, you know, I could honestly make a difference in my community, make a difference around the people around me. I think I was starting to be more like known in that in that sense around uh, Indiana, of people actually knowing what I do, actually hearing about me more. And I think, <clears throat> you know, growing up watching NBA basketball a lot, uh, my favorite player was Steve Nash and. Uh, one of Jason's favorite players, Russell Westbrook, and he brought up the idea. Uh, it might have been like two years ago, uh, starting a nonprofit. And I think I knew right away that this was something that I wanted to do. I mean, one of my players being Steve Nash, he also started a nonprofit, and and so he he knew Russell Westbrook had started a nonprofit, and he was looking into it, and he was like, "Yo, I went to school for this. This is something that I feel like I should come to you and." And you have the platform and you're able to bring it to life. And I kind of talked to him. We sat down and we felt like if we really put our minds to it, it could be big. Right. And we had a whole bunch of teachers, supporters and people that he had talked to. And uh, they honestly felt like it was the, the right thing to do. And, you know, it's just something that I really never really second guessed it. Um, he came to me and he said, uh, you know, what basically the, the mission is, is we're going to go around to public schools and we're going to talk to young kids and kind of reinvent the community. And um uh, what we plan to do is have like open gyms and have extracurricular activities for them and kind of have a uh, teach them through education. And one of our teaching points would be mental, mental health. I think that's really important for the young age. Uh, and I think when he brought that idea up to me, it's just like, yeah, let's do it. You know, let's, let's do it. So that was like season three and then season five, uh, we're here now and we kind of got it going right now. We're, we're applying for certain stuff, the 501 C tax exempt status. Um, and that's just something that once we get, we're going to be able to do more and more stuff. But yeah, the main goal is to to get a community center. Uh, and I think we can do it um, with the help of everybody uh, in our community. I think I got a lot of supporters back home, friends, family. And it's just something special that I feel like that I'm going to have to the day I die. And, you know, I really, truly love being with kids and talking to kids and learning what they're what they're going through and learning how they think. And I think it's special for the young generation to have something to look up to and have something to to strive for. And I think a lot of these kids, they don't really know what they want to be yet. Right. And um, I think it's, it, I think it's something exciting for me to go and talk to them and tell them how to my journey of, of what I did and, and how I, I came up and how, um, how I'm now in season five going into season six and how, what they could do with their life and how they can uh, better it. But I think the special part of what Jason has mentioned to me is not only is it going to be for kids, it's going to be for families as well. So uh, you know, the parents can come in and learn a few things. We're going to have a lot of teachers uh, teach stuff about financial stuff and education. So it'll be special, Phil. It's going to be something that I feel like families can come to. And and like I said, the main goal is to get a community center and, and build it around my uh, local area. Man, that, I mean, that's just wonderful because, you know, a lot of times people get in these positions where they, they can have opportunities and platforms and they don't necessarily take advantage of it. And uh, the fact that you're doing it in in one of the most selfless acts, I mean, nothing but respect to that, man. That's crazy. Yeah, appreciate sure. it. Echo that. And uh, for those who have listened to the every episode of the podcast, you know, a few dozen of you, um, you'll know I like to give a little bit of career advice from time to time. I'm a very amateur podcast host, but I am a career professional. I've been doing startups now for 15 years. And I can tell you one of the things that you will hear successful people say all the time is, you know, especially if you're trying to start things, create things from scratch, right? It's uh, consistency, persistence, you know, doing it like outlasting you know, the the down moments, right? The roadblocks you hit, the failures, picking yourself back up, dusting yourself off. And I can tell you, you've got, you know, the the framework down for what I think people should do in their 20s. You know, take big career leaps, go try something crazy and new. You know, you're moving to new cities, you're playing in this experimental 2K league, you're learning how to deal with other people, you're learning how to be a team player, a leader, you're learning how to deal with bosses, you know, all that kind of stuff. On the side, do things proactive that, you know, mean something to you, that are, you're passionate about. And I can tell you, I did that constantly. I, I really didn't know what I wanted to do, but I knew I wanted to, like, start companies. I knew I wanted to start cool, innovative stuff. And in my 20s, I just, you know, I've kind of found a way into these tech startups, you know, through a sales gig because I could talk and then would just go on like Tuesday night, Wednesday night, Thursday, I just go to these little like startup meetups, you know, it was for design. I, need, I didn't want to be a designer. I just wanted to know like what do designers talk about, you know, 
on Tuesday nights. Um, and so I would go do all those things proactively. And uh, I can tell you, you know, you, so pro, you know, for most of the case, most of the time, you know, what your specific vision for what you're going to accomplish is, you know, when you're that young and you're just kind of trying things probably isn't going to turn out, but I can assure you, you do those things, you be proactive, you be a good person, a hard worker, you know, you do more than you're paid for soon enough, you'll be paid for more than you do, but you're going to build a fraternity or a sorority or just like a network of people who are of the same type of mindset, you know, of a productive, progressive mindset, not, you know, people who just sit around complaining about all their, their troubles all the time, but people who go out and make things happen. Those people, you'll either bring them with you or they'll bring you with them, uh, but good things will happen uh, as a result of that. That was certainly the formula for my success, you know, taking the first step before I could see the whole staircase, not really knowing where I was going, but being confident that I was heading in the right direction and I wanted to challenge myself. And, you know, it worked out for me. And I think, you know, for the most part, whenever I've seen someone kind of take that approach to their life, it, it seems to work out for them. And you hear that again a lot from some of the most you know, successful kind of business uh, people in the world who have started some of the most revolutionary companies. So keep doing what you're doing, buddy. You're on the right track. Yes, sir. Appreciate that. Thank you. And final note, um, before we wrap this thing up, let's get some predictions. So I don't want to make it as easy as just saying, like, predict who's going to win the championship and you're kind of throwing a dart at the board. But just, like, give us some playoff predictions. What do you think is going to play out? Like, who should we keep an eye on? Maybe not necessarily who's going to win, but who's going to surprise people. And then maybe, you know, who do you think is going to win? But whatever you're generally kind of seeing and feeling from these upcoming playoffs. Yeah, I think um, let's start with 3v3. I think uh, the 3v3 teams – uh, it's kind of like a toss-up, but uh, my favorite to win it is going to be the Pacers. I really feel like Vandy, Wolf, and Joe Moore have been killing it in the 3v3, and they got something special going on because Vandy, um, he was one of those guys that came from stage two, but he has – he's found a way, right? He's going he's gonna to be one of those guys that know how to adjust, and he's been really good. And I also feel like the Magic can be a sleeper in the 3v3. They just won the ticket. But the the crazy thing about Unguardable is, is he's doing it with a center. So they're doubling him and he's still getting open. He's still shooting it. And when you have a center on the court in threes, which isn't really the meta, which the pay, the Pistons also do it in their 3v3 playoffs, but I feel like the Magic are going to do it a little bit better. I feel like if you get up with that center, it's over. Like these, the center's going to out-rebound the, the 6-8 power forward every time, nine times out of ten. And it's going to be tough for the other team to get rebounds. It's going to be tough for them to to be able to – get stops, and then try to get that old board over that seven foot. It's just tough. So I feel like the Magic can be a sleeper, but I got the Pacers win 3v3. And then if we were to talk about 5v5, this is a tough one, but um, I'm going to have to say T-Wolves are going to gonna take it this year. Um, I feel like they, have a, they just have a great team. They've been working well together, and I don't really know what's going to happen in 5v5. Honestly, I really don't. But I feel like the T Wolves have been with, been with each other for a while to understand like what it takes to win. They lost last year to the Jazz, I believe, and it was just something that you just really didn't see coming. And um, and I don't really know, or was it the no? It was the Warriors, I believe. But it was just something you just didn't see coming. And I think they kind of un understood what they had to do last year, and they're going to do it this year. And I feel like the the T Wolves might win the five v five. They got a great team. All right, you heard it, heard it here first. Type, you're always a wealth of knowledge on this stuff, man. You're always super helpful in the off season trying to figure out what's going on with the players and whatnot. And, oh, I don't know you guys all heard that come through my mic, but my doorbell rang. And Phil, you know what that means. I am 9-0. and oh. Nine straight podcasts I have received my Uber Eats first. That's ridiculous. Like Mine's only Great three minutes away, here. too. Well, Mine's only three safe. minutes away. I thought I had you this time. But you guys. Appreciate you. Drive safe, drive safe. You guys. <laughs> hey, this guy. <laughs> That means it's time for me to enjoy some Caribbean. Tight, my boy, it was great to chat with you again. Like I said in the text, you know, we got to get together, grab a dinner before you all ship out of town. For sure. uh, I think I might even come down this Thursday. I think you guys have an activation with Bell at the uh, Fan Expo. So uh, I'll hit you and Kenny up. Maybe we make uh, a dinner reservation for after that and go to town and see Toronto a little bit. Nice. Let's do it. I'll see you soon. All right. That's wonderful. And you will see the jealousy all over me as I am not in Canada. <laughs> But I am here on the Raptors 2K podcast brought to you by Uber Eats. Another fantastic episode. Thank you, Shane, for joining me, obviously, as my co-host. And, of course, Type, our amazing guest, wishing you nothing uh, but the best in your endeavors in the future. Because I can see you're doing a lot of good things. And I'm sure everybody appreciates that. You guys take care, and we'll see you on the next one.